Do you ever notice how some days seem harder than others? Why is it that I can respond to something in one way on one day and in a completely different way on another? Why is it that something doesn't affect me or bother me too much on one day, but the same thing can totally derail me on a different day? It's like I'm a different person. What's changed? Well, that's exactly what we're going to explore together through this message. We're going to learn from an example in Jesus' life, and we're going to see what it's got to do with the word resilience, elastic bands, and some play -Doh. Life is up and down. We feel different one day to the next, and we respond differently one day to the next. There are those days where we feel more emotional than others. There are those days where we just seem angrier or more upset or grumpier than on other days. And then there are those days where we feel lighter, happier, and more optimistic than others. There are days where we feel strong, disciplined, and in control. And then there are days where we feel like we could get knocked over with a feather. We're easily tempted and our morale is low. It's on days like this that we can easily do or say things that we later regret. Just think back to a recent time where you felt low. What was the knock-on impact of that? How did you treat or speak to the people closest to you? How patient were you with them? Did you do the things that you know you should do and resist the things you know you shouldn't do? I know that for me, when I'm feeling low, life gets a bit harder. I'm more irritable, I'm less focused and I'm less disciplined. And I know that I'm more susceptible to temptation. If I'm gonna mess up, chances are it's gonna happen when I'm feeling low. It's at times like these that we can act in a way that isn't in line with who we are. It's out of character. The problem is, the more we do this, the more we allow this to go unchecked, the more it becomes part of who we are. It becomes part of our character. And it becomes what people expect of us. Now, there's nothing new there. You know this. You can see it in yourself. And you can certainly see it in the people around you. So what do we do about it? Well, normally, we try to lift ourselves out of the slump we're feeling. Or we try to drag people out of the slump they're in. Often this doesn't work. You know, just saying to yourself, pull yourself together, rarely works. And you know, surprising as it sounds, telling someone to not be grumpy when they are grumpy doesn't have a positive effect. Nor does asking them, are you grumpy? Or why are you grumpy? You know, the funny thing is, I know this is the case, but I'm still often tempted to ask the same questions. So if the things we normally try to address this doesn't work, what will? Well, the secret lies in that word resilience. The definition of resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. That's what we're talking about. How do we recover quickly when life hits, when we feel low? So let's take a look at something that happened to Jesus and see what we can learn from how he responded to the situation. Jesus has just been baptised. Now, this is a big moment in Jesus' life and ministry. As Jesus was immersed in the water of the River Jordan, we're told that heaven was opened and the Spirit of God descended like a dove and rested on Jesus. And there was this voice from heaven, which I reckon sounded a bit like James Earl Jones saying, You are my son and the one true king. It can be easy to think that this was all for the benefit of the people witnessing Jesus' baptism. But I think it was for Jesus' benefit too. See, it's so difficult to comprehend Jesus. He was fully God and he was fully human. We're often in danger of falling down on one side of this equation. We either elevate his divine nature and we reduce his human nature, or we elevate his human nature and we reduce his divine nature. I wonder if the human side of Jesus needed confirmation and affirmation that he was who we thought he was. Surely this would be enough to erase any doubt from anyone's mind about the true identity of Jesus. Anyway, as soon as this happens, we're told that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And Matthew gives us some incredible insight. Matthew tells us that after 40 days fasting, Jesus was hungry. I would think so. I'm really hungry by 6pm after not eating since lunchtime. How do you think Jesus feels at this point? He's been by himself in the wilderness without food for 40 days. I've been to the wilderness. It's a barren wasteland. There isn't much there. There's nothing to do and there's not much to look at. But of course, Jesus wasn't alone. He'd gone to the wilderness to spend time with his father. I'd imagine that after these 40 days, Jesus felt close to God, but he was also tired and hungry. Part of him was thriving and part of him was struggling. 
At this point, the devil comes to him and tempts him. And Matthew includes it like it's a throwaway comment, like this is a normal everyday occurrence. Is this some sort of cosmic showdown, the devil versus the son of God? These two forces of good and evil come together to battle it out in a fight to the death. Well, that's not quite what happens, largely because they're not on the same level. You know, God and the devil are not equals. This is not like a showdown between Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader or Thanos and the Avengers. I've got no idea how this happened or what it looked like, but I'm pretty sure Jesus wasn't tempted by some dude in a red lycra bodysuit with horns and a pitchfork. The truth is, we don't know lots about who or what the devil is because the Bible doesn't actually tell us lots. So let's not worry too much about who is doing the tempting and let's focus on who is being tempted. The point is, Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted to do the things that the devil was in inviting him to do. That means there's a part of Jesus that must wanted to have done this stuff. Matthew tells us that the tempter, now that's his description of the devil, came to Jesus and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now what's wrong with that? What's wrong with Jesus turning stones into bread? I'm assuming this is at the end of his fast. You know, isn't that a good use of resources? If I found myself in the middle of the desert and was hungry because I hadn't eaten for 40 days and I had the power to turn stones into bread, I would. And perhaps I'd turn some into cheeseburgers and others into banoffee pie as well. I don't think it's the stones into food that's the issue here. You know, see, not long after this, Jesus is at a wedding where they've run out of wine and Jesus takes water and he turns it into wine. What's the difference? Well, partly it's who's asking. At the wedding, his mum, Mary, asks him to do it. And Jesus doesn't want to, but he does because we all know we should do what our mums ask us to do. Here, the context is very different, even if the request is similar. Listen again to what the devil says to Jesus. If you really are the son of God, I think this is the struggle that Jesus has with his human nature. Am I really the son of God? You know, this will confirm it. Just do this simple miracle and all will be well. Your hunger will be eased and you will know who you truly are. But Jesus doesn't give in. He responds by quoting scripture. Man does not live on bread alone. So the devil tries again. He takes him to Jerusalem and he puts him on top of the temple. It's the tallest building in the city and it's the focal point of the Jewish faith. The devil says to Jesus, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. See those words again. If you are the son of God. Now surely this will confirm to Jesus that he is who he thinks he is. What goes through Jesus' mind at this point? Well, he's tempted, which means part of him must want to give this a go. Part of him must want to do this, otherwise there's no temptation. You see, if you place a plate of garlic mushrooms in front of me and say, go ahead, eat up, there's no part of me that wants to eat them. They're slugs. Even with garlic on, they're still slimy and horrible. I'm not tempted in any way. Jesus is not being offered a plate of slugs to eat. Part of him wants to do this. Again, Jesus quotes scripture at the devil. It's written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Finally, the devil takes Jesus to a very high mountain and he shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. He says, I will give all this to you if you bow down and worship me. Now, I think the first two temptations are the same. Jesus is being tempted to confirm his divine nature by using his divine nature. Here, Jesus is being tempted to take a shortcut. You see, all the kingdoms are Jesus's. That's what's waiting for him at the end of this journey. He is Lord of all. But there's a cross that stands between him and that reality. The devil is giving him the option to bypass the pain and the suffering and to have all that glory now. But Jesus didn't go to the cross for his glory. It was for his father's glory and our salvation. It was so we can be united with the father just as he is united with the father. Jesus doesn't give in. He says, away from me, Satan, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So what's my point? Well, firstly, Jesus was tempted. And I think the timing of this tells us a lot about ourselves. You see, Jesus was tired and hungry, but he also had this amazing encounter with God, both through his baptism and through spending 40 days in the wilderness with God. 
I know I'm often at my most vulnerable when I'm physically not at my best. I know my fuse is shortest when I'm tired, hungry, or hangry as we like to call it in our house, and when I'm not feeling great. I don't respond as well as I can in those moments. I also don't do the things I know I should, and I'm tempted to do the things I know I shouldn't. But what about you? When are you not at your best? What are the circumstances that can cause you to do things you might later regret? I also know that I am most vulnerable to temptation off the back of a spiritual high. It doesn't seem to make sense, but it does seem to be the case. And it's not just my problem. I've heard many people share this too. You see, you have a moment where you feel close to God, where your relationship with him takes a giant leap forward. You connect with him in worship. You make a commitment to him with your life. And the next day, you start to question how authentic that was. You know, one moment you're lost in praise and adoration for God. And the next, you're not totally sure if God is real. And you also find yourself shouting at the kids. And you see someone in need that you could help, but you ignore it. Justifying to yourself that you're too busy to get involved. And perhaps there are aspects of your life that you struggle with. You know, things you're tempted to do that you know you shouldn't do. There are moments when it's easy to resist temptation, when it's easy to not give in to sin or even think about it. Those moments when you feel closest to God. However, for whatever reason, the next day is often a day where those temptations come back in force. My point is that this is exactly what's going on in Jesus. He's just had this great experience, but he's also tired and hungry. And so he's more vulnerable to temptation than at other times. But he doesn't give in. He stays strong. How? Life throws things at us. Every experience tries to shape and mould us. A bit like this Play-Doh. You know, you give it some external pressure and it bends and it shifts shape. It changes form under the pressure. It absorbs the pressure and it changes as a result. Perhaps you are like a ball of Play-Doh. You are shaped by external forces. That as life happens, it changes and it moulds you. You take on the form of what is happening around you. Play-Doh isn't very resilient. It doesn't recover quickly from the pressure it's under. It absorbs and it changes shape as a result. It's drastically different. Its character is changed because of this pressure. The other option is to be like this elastic band. Notice how it too changes and reacts to the pressure it's under, but it quickly springs back into its original shape. We're supposed to feel life. We are supposed to be impacted by the stuff around us. We're supposed to be tempted to bend and to change. It's okay to feel low. It's okay to be tempted. If we didn't feel those things, we would be rigid, lifeless stones, but we're not. We're impacted by what life throws at us, and we're all tempted in different ways. The key thing is how we respond. An elastic band is extremely resilient. It does stretch and it does bend, but it springs back into place. It keeps its form and it keeps its character. Resilience is the capacity to quickly recover from difficulty. We can often think that strength is the ability to not be stretched like this. That if we're strong and have it all together, we're not moved. We're not impacted by what's going on around us. That we're not tempted to do the things we know we shouldn't. That isn't strength. Let me be really clear. It's okay to have those moments where you feel low. It's okay to be tempted. It's okay to feel the pressure of life. Strength is found in those moments where we're stretched, in those moments where life presses in on us, when we're vulnerable. Strength is found in the ability to not give in to that temptation, but to be resilient and spring back to what we know is true. What I see in Jesus is that he knew who he was, even though I think his human nature was tempted to find ways to confirm this through the spectacular. He knew he was the son of God and he knew his character. He knew how he should respond and how he should act. Who are you? What is your character? What is your identity? Jesus probably could turn stones into bread. He probably could have thrown himself off the temple and would have been caught by angels. But that isn't who he is. It can be so easy for us to think we are defined by what we do and what other people think about us. And that's the third temptation for Jesus, to have all the nations bow down to him and worship him. If you are what you do and what people think or say about you, then chances are you're a ball of Play-Doh. 
You will be shaped and defined by these external pressures. You will spend your life chasing after the affirmation and approval of others. Your value, your sense of self-worth will be defined by what you're able to do and what people say about you. Jesus is not like this. He knew who he was before he got out of bed in the morning. He knew his identity, his value, his purpose. He was the son of God and he was sent by God to close the gap between humanity and God, to make it possible for us to experience eternity with God. Jesus was crystal clear about who he was and whose he was. In my best moments, I know I'm more than what people think or say about me and I know that I'm more than what I do. In my best moments, I know that I'm a child of God, that I'm created by him, that I'm accepted and loved by him. I know that God loves me and I know that in him is the source of my identity. The problem is that I'm not always at my best. Things happen that challenge this sense of identity. It's often easier to listen to what people think rather than what God says. It's easier to find value and worth in tangible things like what I'm able to do than it is in the knowledge that God loves me and values me for who I am. If Jesus was tempted in this, how much more will we be? But that's where resilience comes in. In those moments when life is stretching us, when we're tempted to buy into what other people think or seek validation in the approval of others, when we're tempted to do things that are not in line with our character, to give into that temptation that's seductively calling our name, saying, give it a go, it will be okay, no one will know. Resilience enables us to withstand that pressure and that temptation and stay true to who we are and who God has created us to be. Resilience is found in the ability to know who you are and whose you are. It's found and forged in that truth so that when life tries to threaten it, you're able to hold on to what you know is true, even when you're tempted to seek validation elsewhere. Perhaps you're not sure what this truth is. Perhaps you've never encountered God in a way where you're able to hear what he says about you. Perhaps you've never come to that point where you choose to allow your identity to be found in the fact that you are a son or a daughter of God, that he loves you and he has a purpose for you. Head over to fbcnext.com slash who am I to discover some of the things that God says about you. This unlocks so many things in life. Having this security in our identity and our value, you now allowing ourselves to not be defined by what we do or what others think about us, truly is life-changing and life-giving and life-affirming. It gives us this resilience to withstand and positively respond to those challenging moments of life. It also gives us the ability to be better at the things that we were focused on to validate us. My identity and value is assured before I even get out of bed in the morning. And so I'm free to focus on being who God made me to be and to do the things I'm created to do. This happens when I live out of my identity rather than striving to find it through what other people think of me and the things I do. Imagine the sense of freedom, the sense of joy, the sense of peace that comes from living like this. Imagine the difference it can make to the way you're able to respond to those pressure moments of life. Imagine the strength it can give you to resist temptation. Imagine being able to be who you were created to be, to be able to respond to whatever life throws at you with resilience. Imagine finding yourself in the middle of a stressful situation, but you're able to keep your head. You don't allow what's going on around you to impact how you speak to the people in front of you. Imagine that feeling of temptation where you want to do what you know you shouldn't do. You've been here before and each time you struggle to resist, but today, something is different. Even though you're tempted, you have the strength of character and you've got the presence of mind to not give in. Imagine being able to not have to scroll through your social media feed, looking to see how many people have liked your latest post because it makes you feel valuable and seen. The good news is you don't have to imagine it, you can live it. Allow your identity and your value to be found in who God says you are rather than what you do or what people say about you. So here's three simple things to be able to hold on to your resilience. Firstly, be aware of those moments where you are not at your best. Secondly, know who you are. And thirdly, know whose you are. And if you don't know the answer to those last two, let me tell you again, you are a child of God. He loves you, he delights in you. 
He sees incredible value, worth and potential in you.